My name is Harold Furch, Scott Roth, and I will be your host today. We are honored to have with us today Marsha Blackburn, representative from the great state of Tennessee, my home state, and uh, she'll be speaking to us today about rural broadband issues. Uh, just a housekeeping note, uh, our next session will be June 6th, back here at the Hudson Institute. Tom Hazlett, professor of economics, will be speaking about his new book, Political Spectrum, and he'll be talking about the next chapter for that. But today, we are really honored to have with us Representative Blackburn. She is, uh, I would say, one of the most articulate, persuasive speakers in Washington. She came to Washington to represent people in her home district back in Tennessee. She has done an incredible job of that. She is an articulate speaker on just about any issue, uh, and uh, she is now chairman of the Telecommunications Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, we are really honored to have you here today and looking Thank forward you. to your comments. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here, and I want to thank all of you for taking your time uh, to be in. Of course, when we talk about growth in the tech sector and growth in telecommunications and getting broadband out to our constituents, those are issues that I love to work on. Uh, I represent a district that is 19 counties. 10,000 square miles, and three of my counties would be considered suburban. The balance are rural, and because of that, broadband expansion is something that is a top-of-mind issue in my district. I have begun to say broadband is the principal infrastructure issue for the 21st century. It's what we hear about every time we go into a community, meet with local electeds, meet with school officials, talk with people that are delivering health care, and talk with those that are trying to create jobs and recruit industry into areas. Let's go back and let's look a little bit what every administration has done to try to spur infrastructure development. And go back to the Clinton administration. When there in the mid-90s, we started to hear about this commercialization was going to be something that was going to change the way business operated. Now, many people probably didn't think it would change every business, but it has. And now broadband is a key part of the delivery system and the functionality of every single sector of our nation's economy. Now, in the Clinton administration, what they sought to do, which I think was a right step, they tried to work with the GSA to find a way that they could streamline permitting. And they didn't get that uh, completed. You can look at what the Bush administration tried to do. When they wanted to spur the expansion of uh, broadband and deal with some of the public-private partnerships and push broadband out a little bit, then you had the Obama administration, which did $7.2 in federal grants and loans, they were uh, given through the BTOP program. And you look at some of the problems that were there with BTOP. We were just uh, talking about some of the onerous paperwork, problems that were left not solved going back through the Clinton years and the Bush years, and it caused people not to utilize those funds in the manner that we would have liked to have seen that done. So there is still work to do, and I think it gives us a, a great opportunity as we look at an infrastructure bill coming, as we're aware 
that broadband is going to be and is expected to be a title in that infrastructure bill. As we realize from our county mayors and our local leaders that access to broadband is the number one issue that they have. They're not going to be able to get those jobs they want. They're not going to be able to utilize 21st century health care, some of the new telemedicine concepts, some of the remote monitoring that is there, home health, which will tell you if we had reliable internet, I could FaceTime patients instead of putting them in the car and taking them to a local clinic. Students that want advanced educational opportunity, but they're not able to access that opportunity at home. What do they do? They get in the car and they drive 15 miles to a local McDonald's or to a public library and sit in the parking lot and do their homework. Because right now, the broadband has become such an integral part of the way we live our lives and the way we conduct our business. So it is a prime issue. Well, there is a report that um, Accenture had done on the economic benefits of smart cities. And they were looking at the 10-year impact on the GDP of being $500 billion if you increase the access level in cities. And I looked at that, and I thought, you know what? I think we need to just not think about smart cities, about we need to look at how we push this out so that it is smart counties, smart America, so that everyone has access and can get access to a high-speed Internet and increase their opportunities in those areas that I've talked about. And um, some things that we're going to do at committee, and let me hit on these before we do some questions, and I get back to the Hill for votes. You know, we do have that day job that we have to get to the floor and vote. Uh, the maps. Do you realize it has been uh, since June 2014 since we have updated the broadband maps? So getting these maps accurate is going to be a priority. Before we look at money that is going to come through the infrastructure bill or through the budget or anything else, we need to know what we're dealing with. So making certain that the maps are correct. Now, I will tell you, the FCC's maps on the state of Tennessee are wrong. They would lead you to believe that 95% of the state has access to high-speed Internet. And I can tell you exactly where it drops and where you don't have that signal. And people that live in those communities can do that also. Now, in our state, we were very pleased. Um, the state legislature commissioned a study and they have built out their broadband strategy based on that study and using the maps that they developed. They're much more accurate than what we have. So maps are going to, to be important. I think that also making certain um, that, that we are going to deal with federal law. And going back, this is something that the Bush administration, FCC, wanted to do and didn't get done. Make that good inventory so that we know what our federal assets are. And then develop a plan for how we are going to expand broadband on those federal assets. Some of these are going to be in parks and lands that are separate. Some are going to be in cities, but we need to know where they can play a part. And then uh, move that on down to looking at poles, uh, looking at property, looking at uh, connections, and permitting the environmental permits that are going to be needed 
to push the expansion of broadband. Um, what we want to do is make certain that as companies are partnering with local entities, that they do not face duplicative requirements. That means maybe it's time to go back and look at developing that master form and have the GSA look at a master form and then have your local and state entities utilize that master form. Our goal should be how do we simplify this process and enable the expansion of broadband more quickly so that counties and cities are able to partner with the private sector and push forward connectivity and access to the internet. And the federal government should be a partner in that role. They should not be a stumbling block, but they should be a partner in that, in that role. Uh, money. Issue always comes around to money, doesn't it? And existing programs in the federal government have about $10 billion that are leveraged every year in grants and loans. Uh, when you look at the USF through the FCC, you've got about $9 billion, and that comes out in support for networks that are in high-cost areas goes out for schools, for libraries, for rural health. And uh, the Lifeline program also comes through that $9 billion. So simplifying how uh, individuals access and pull down and utilize those funds. The RUS loans, that is about $750 million a year. Uh, VTOP and BIP. That came about, as you all know, in 2009, and um, then those programs are there. We want to make certain that the next round is more successful and more user-friendly than BTOP and BIP. Uh, you can't have broadband deployment without spectrum. Uh, we know that the National Broadband Plan in 2010 identified 347 megahertz of spectrum that were there for mobile broadband, and it could be uh, unleashed over a 10-year period of time. There were recently two successful auctions in this space. AWS-3 generated $44 billion in revenue and it cleared 65 megahertz of spectrum. The broadcast incentive auction raised $19.8 billion and cleared 70 megahertz of spectrum. So we will go back in and look at, re and look at spectrum, look at a repack. We also were going to push forward some good bipartisan legislation. You have Anna Eshoo's Dig Once bill. I think that putting that conduit down and making plans for expansion are important to do. You have the Guthrie Matsui Federal Spectrum Incentive Act that is out there, and Kinzinger has the Rural Spectrum Accountability Act, uh, all pieces of legislation that are going to come before us. The Senate is working on the Mobile Now bill. We will look at that as it gets ready to come across to us and I look forward to visiting that. As we move forward, I would want you to know that as we look at broadband expansion and getting into unserved areas, whether they're rural, suburban, or urban, and there are completely unserved areas in each of those entities, that we are going to do this on a technology neutral basis. You're going to have areas where wireline or fiber or wireless or fixed wireless or satellite will be the best way to deploy that high speed internet. And our steps should not be something that is going to choose winners and losers within those technologies. 
it should be to create win-win situations so that the areas that are unserved have access to a high-speed internet. So thank you all so much. Back to you. Thank you. Mrs. Blackburn, you serve, as you described, a, a heavily rural district back mm -hmm. in Tennessee. Uh, and I'm sure when you go home to your district, you hear stories from whether it's county administrators or local police departments or schools or just people in their homes, some of the difficulties they're having getting brought sure. in. We have lots of people on our online audience, uh, many, many more than we have here in person. Could you just give us some examples of some of the problems that you're hearing from your constituents? Oh, yes. I'll be more than happy to. I'll give you. Uh, last week, I was out in my district and talking with some, some of our constituents, and the issue of broadband came up. And after I finished this meeting, a lady came up to me, and she said, thank you for raising this issue, because she, as an adult, chose to go back to a workforce development training program at the tech center. And there were classes that were virtual space classes that she was going to attend that were required as part of the curriculum. So she would need to stream these lectures. And she gave me an example of one she had done two or three weeks prior. And because of not having proper connectivity there at her home, and she could not leave her home at that point in time. It took her four and a half hours to do a one-hour lecture. And she said, you know, it makes it almost impossible to do your homework. Many times I hear from people with small-based businesses, and they will talk about the manufacturing company, and I've had this happen two or three times in areas. They had an economic development recruit, and they were so excited about it. And then they came in to test the internet to see if it was going to be possible to remotely program this equipment. And many times with the auto industry that is present, in Tennessee, some of your just-in-time manufacturers for GM or Nissan or Toyota will go into rural counties. And whether it is tool and die or punch press or um, working with laminates, if they cannot remotely monitor, program and monitor that machinery and have the bandwidth, they will not go into that empty space that is there in that industrial park. And I've had two or three examples in my counties where they've lost individuals that had interest in coming there because there was available space, there was available workforce, but they could not get the consistent high-speed internet that was necessary to be able to handle uh, that equipment. Uh, rural health care is another one where we hear we've got uh, a great resource in our state Vanderbilt University partners with many of our FQHCs and from time to time we will be visiting one of our community health clinics and they will say you know uh, we can use some telemedicine but we cannot take advantage of everything that is there because we don't have consistent high-speed internet having x-rays shipped, uh, being able to ship images for diagnosis, uh, things of this nature, and they just do not have the bandwidth that is necessary to do that. Mrs. Blackburn, you've been a leader on privacy issues on Capitol Hill for many years. I understand uh, you may have a bill that's about ready to, to come up. Can you tell us yeah. a bit about your privacy? I, I can. Uh, I filed it last week. Uh, Brian Fitzpatrick and Bill Flores are the two primary co-sponsors on the bill. We're looking forward to having some Democrat co-sponsorship on it. A couple of members reviewing the bill now. Uh, a couple of members in the Senate that are reviewing it. Our goal is to have it bipartisan and bicameral. 
as we move forward. Uh, this is an issue that I've worked on for, I guess, four or five years. I see Josh Lynch sitting out here. Uh, he was a part of Team Blackburn when we were doing this. Was it about five years ago we started on this, Josh? And um, Mary Bono Mac was chairing uh, CMT at Energy and Commerce, and she and I started a series of hearings looking at privacy and the expectation that individuals have for privacy. I term, term it uh, protecting your virtual you, and it centers around you. Individuals having the toolbox that is necessary to protect yourself online. And um, what we have done is to look at this issue, and I knew we didn't need two regulators with two sets of rules. So you don't need the FTC and the FCC. And I think that industry and consumers don't want this to be a ping pong issue that gets changed every time you have a change of administration. So it's time for Congress to take some action on this. And my bill calls for one regulator with one set of rules for the entire ecosystem. It defines uh, sensitive information and uh, would require opt-in on sensitive information. And then for non-sensitive information would allow for opt-out. But it's uh, beginning a discussion and putting a marker down and encouraging individuals to talk with us and let us hear from them as we move forward with how to best protect privacy. Uh, data security is something that also needs attention, encryption, cyber. Uh, all of those are issues, and many of my constituents look at them as one issue. They don't look at it nuanced as we do in D.C. and say, this is privacy, but that's data security or that's encryption. They look at it as an integrated system and one that is important to how they conduct their business, how they conduct their personal business, and how they utilize education opportunities for their children. Thank you. I could ask questions all day, but I know you need to get back. I Bill, do, yes. I, I want to be sure we have an opportunity to let our audience ask questions. Uh, this gentleman right here in the front. I member for UNESCO Task Force, and together with the Library of Congress, we will have what is called World Digital Library Project. A uh, huge content, uh, high definition, science, culture, and so on. My question is, is it relevant for rural area in the United States, I know only Scandinavia and Japan and Europe, uh, to have access to such a rich content in digital format, curated content, and to for after school, after school, to equip your libraries and museum and also homes for motivation and inspiration for children. Is it relevant? Does it mean anything to rural area? Basically, of high definition, digital high definition content. Uh, Japan and Scandinavia receive it enthusiastically, and this year China started. But it's such a huge, unique content. How would you relate? at rural area to this. Yes, uh, I think it's uh, important for individuals to have access and be able to utilize uh, content that is online. I think it is important for the protections to be there for children as they use the uh, computer facilities that are in these libraries. I was recently in uh, one of our technology colleges, and I walked into the library, and the librarian that was on duty was so pleased to show me what was physical books, as we think of a hardcover book, but then to talk about the number of volumes that were available through the Tennessee Library System, which has been very well developed, uh, that were available online and how he was able to expand the opportunity, the reading opportunities for their students by using that Tennessee uh, online library. Gentleman in the back. 
Thank you, Chairwoman Blackburn, for joining us today and your sure. insights. Uh, my name is Robert Mahaffey. I'm the Executive Director of the Rural School and Community Trust, and we've spent a lot of time through Appalachia and in your home state yes. and district. Um, I'd like to shift the conversation, and former Commissioner, if you want to jump in as well, to E-rate. So you mentioned the Universal Service Fund. The FCC went through this major process, as you know, around E-rate and raising the caps and some of these other things. What do you think in the long history of E-Rate that works? What do you think is still broken? Uh, what, because it's so incredibly essential to the 12 million rural kids that we represent um, across the country. So I'd like your insights on e -rate. Sure, and I think that uh, you'll see as Chairman Pai moves forward with his, I think it's called Digital Divide Agenda, that you're going to probably get a little bit more consistency uh, that comes from there. E-rate has been an important um, component for our schools and the school library systems in our state. I think that, um, as you well know, many of these entities and school systems would like to see a little bit more consistency and clarity and have the assurance that those funds are going to be able to be pulled down once they are promised and then thereby expended, that they're going to be able uh, to have access to those funds. It is such an important part of the educational premise that um, exists today. And it is a way for schools and systems to expand uh, what is available to children in areas that maybe do not have that extensive of a library system, but by, by utilization of that online library, they're able to uh, use those funds, use the internet, allow expanded educational opportunities for children to monitor classes, to participate in lectures, uh, but you need that uh, high-speed internet. You need to be able to have that available for for those schools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with that, thank you very much. I think everybody's in agreement. I think it's so. It's time for broadband expansion. Thank you.